Thank you, Michael, for that embarrassing introduction. <laughs> it's wonderful. I'd like to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, the Bunurong and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, acknowledge that sovereignty of this land was never ceded, and that this was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, and in the organizations that I work with and the work that I do, we advocate for reconciliation by the chosen means of indigenous peoples in the areas that we work in. So I'd like to start my story with sitting at a desk, waiting to open an exam paper. I had my notes with me, I'd studied for months, I was pumped up and I was ready. See, I was an international student, like many of you. Look at this very dodgy photo. I had big hair. As Michael said, I loved hip hop. I wanted to be like a gangster rapper, but I was really just a nerdy Indian kid who studied a lot inside. I looked sort of like what we call a gunda in Bollywood films, like a low-level henchman who was trying to make his way and intimidate people a little bit, kind of a henchman in training. Uh, but really, I had two things that I was thinking about a lot at that time as a student. And I'd like you to remember them because I'll come back to both of them. The first one, how do I get enough points to get my permanent residency? And the second one, what is South Asian media representation in Australia? Are there any media people from South Asian backgrounds on screens or in newspapers? And how can I write about this in my thesis? So I'm here today, through all that, to share my journey and my story in one big idea that has a few different parts. And that big idea is called conscious leadership. And I didn't know it at the time, when I was 21, but I was on a journey towards becoming a conscious leader. I just, I didn't have the vocabulary, I didn't know the words for it. So conscious leadership has a couple of principles, but the most important one is this. Draw a line. Ask yourself, are you above the line or below the line? If you're above the line, you're curious, open, committed to learning, you're working on your self-awareness, and you're willing to see the truth or reality of a situation. If you're below the line, you're closed off, defensive, concerned with being right, and wanting to win but for yourself only. In short, if you're above the line, you're aligning with your purpose. If you're below the line, you're just after something specific, like money or power. If I'm being honest, when I was a student, I just wanted a shortcut. I wanted to get my visa, I wanted it to be right, I wanted to get paid and maybe get rich, and without even knowing it, I was acting below the line. So let's come back to the story where I started. I was about to take this exam, uh, and that part of the story is actually true. I, I was a few points short from my permanent residency visa and decided to take a translator's exam in Spanish because I studied it at uni and grown up in Los Angeles, even though I'm originally from India. Uh, if I passed, I'd have enough points to get my permanent residency, and I could stay in Australia. But there's another part of the story I started with that isn't true. I really actually didn't study that hard. Until then, I'd never had perfect grades, but I was always, like, I'd always passed my subjects. You know, I always thought, oh, I'll get over the line, um, or whatever I could. And so then I opened this exam paper that was sitting in front of me. Task number one, translate this passage of a Freudian psycho anal uh, psychological analysis of young people from Santiago, Chile. Shit. Task number two, translate this article talking about the mating habits of a particular Japanese mollusk gastropod. Double shit. There were, it took me most of the exam time to just translate those headlines. Uh, there were words in there that I, I'd never even heard about in any language. I spent increasingly sweaty moments just fumbling through my dictionary that I brought with me, knowing that I needed a 70% to pass. I left that exam feeling absolutely sick. A little while later, I got my score. Any guesses? I got a 7 out of 100. I felt terrible. But I had one more chance to take this exam. So I studied a little bit better, I took it again,
but I didn't look over the things that I'd gotten wrong. I didn't face my failure and really learn from it because hanging over my head this entire time was the feeling of failure, was the feeling that failure was inevitable, that I was just gonna fail again no matter what I did, that the system was rigged against me, and I didn't know how to get away from that feeling or deal with it. So I walked into the next exam, and I talked myself into kind of feeling ready, and it was just as hard. I read the first question, translate a Mongolian political psychoanalysis, and I knew I was fucked. I got a 45% on that exam, and I had to leave Australia. But at that point, a funny thing happened. I had a few months between failing the exam and having to leave, and in that time, something changed. I spent it moping for the first week, and then after that, I spent it free. I traveled. I hung out with my friends and with my partner. I traveled a, a little bit around. Um, I accepted my failure in a sense, and I didn't let it hold a cloud over me. And without realizing it, I was practicing another principle of conscious leadership. See, conscious leadership is about working with your feelings, not running away from them. And so often, we're shown ideas about leaders who can control their emotions or manage their feelings, you know, squash them or bury them or resist them and fight against them or even, in some cases, uh, apologize for how they're feeling. But that's not how it works. See, emotions are just energy in motion. They occur in your body. Core emotions like anger and fear and sadness joy and sexual feelings. So if you want to be a conscious leader, you have to find those feelings in your body. Breathe through them. Vocalize them if you need to. Allow them, accept them, and let them move through you fully. Even feelings like failure. The important principle is this, that when you're having a feeling, those feelings are always telling you something. And they have wisdom but you need to learn the lessons that they're telling you and channel that energy into acting above the line. So you can feel each of these feelings above the line or below it. For example, with anger, anger above the line is that something isn't serving you anymore or a boundary has been crossed or there's been some sort of injustice. But anger below the line is about blame and criticism. Sadness is another example. Sadness above the line is saying goodbye to something and letting go, as sad as I was when I failed my exam. But sadness below the line is a victim mentality that says, poor me, nothing good can happen. Even joy can be below the line. That's when you take your happiness and you base it on external circumstances instead of what's inside you. I'm happy with having a birthday cake and everyone around me, but if no one celebrates my birthday the next week, then I'm miserable and I'm lonely. So slowly I processed my failure. It was anger, it was sadness, but I processed it fully. And before I left, I had a plan with my partner. Because of the fun that we had had, because of the relationship that we'd built during the time I had processed and after I'd failed, she, we got closer and she decided to sponsor me to come back to Australia. So I spent nine months away. When I came back, I had to try and find a job. And it took a few months of applications and knockbacks, um, and it's quite a challenge, but eventually I landed a job in communications at a university. It was a low-level entry kind of job, and I worked in a small office. And there was one other person who worked there. And honestly, I was a little bit lonely. Um, I was caught up in how things were happening to me. Um, and in my office, there was an older Aussie woman, we'll call her Clarice. Uh, and she told me that I wasn't doing my roster duty of cleaning up the kitchenette every day. And the problem was that I went out to lunch every day. So I didn't even use the kitchenette. And I thought to myself, ah, why should I do that? Like, why should I clean the kitchenette? Um, I couldn't stop thinking about all the little things that she was saying to me, which we now call microaggressions. I didn't know, but I was still acting below the line. See, conscious leadership teaches us that when something happens to us, we can stay present or we can drift. Unless we consciously shift out of the perspective of righteousness or entitlement to one of making and finding solutions, we can find ourselves making up a story about what's happening to us. You might be making up a story about what's happening in your life right now. 
and we can find ourselves in, dum dum dum, the drama triangle. What's the drama triangle? There's three parts of a drama triangle. You're a victim, you're a villain, or you're a hero. The drama triangle is the core basis of storytelling, whether that's stories we tell ourselves, stories we see in the media, or stories that happen in organizations and in workplaces or in teams. So in my job, I was the victim. What was me? I was being unfairly criticized. Why should I have to clean the kitchen? Clarice was the villain, saying all those cutting remarks to me. Maybe she was racist, or maybe she was just old, or maybe she just didn't get it. And of course, I was also the hero. I was the dashing young man who knew how to do things best, and I was righteous in everything that I thought. And I was so caught up in the drama triangle that I never sat down with Clarice to just talk things through. I never took 100% responsibility for making things better or accepting anything that she had to say is true. And eventually, the uni head office moved to Sydney, and I was let go. And then came one of the biggest years of my life. And in fact, one of the biggest years in the state of Victoria, 2009. I eventually found a job as an ass a junior assistant manager in the Victorian government in media and emergency management. It had been a really quiet summer, they said, up to that point when I started. And then it started to get hot. We had three days above 43 degrees in January. And the temperature peaked on the 30th of January in 2009 at 45 degrees. And then on the 7th of February, we in Victoria experienced one of the darkest days that we've ever had, Black Saturday. For those of you who don't know what that is, um, this is a history of the present. It was one of the darkest days in Australian peacetime history. 173 people lost their lives. 450 people were injured. 450,000 hectares of land were burned just in this state alone. More than a million wild animals were lost, and more than 2,000 people lost their homes. I was working for the Emergency Services Commissioner in the Victorian Government State Control Center. I had a front row seat for the way the systems we had in place couldn't cope and collapsed. Over the next eight weeks, the fires raged. Part of my job, I read every major news article about it every single day. My team dealt with 176,000 media inquiries from around the world in three months. We tried to do our best to give out the most accurate public information we could to help the communities that were struggling. After the crisis settled, we went through a two-year royal commission while also preparing for the next season and helping communities recover from the previous one. The royal commission told us that much of what we did and the way that the system set up were a failure that things needed to change, and that this was the reality of climate change megafire that we saw again just a few years ago. During this time, I learned a lot about myself. I learned that I could stay cool in a crisis. I learned that uh, my emotions would then catch up with me later. That I'd grown up in a fire prone area, and so I saw my own community and the communities that, that were lost and the people that died. But I was equally naive the complexity and the politics of it all, and I saw the best of government and the worst of it as well. I saw great leadership and poor leadership and great leaders who got into tight corners and political situations that made them choose decisions that resulted in poor leadership. And then a few months later, something else happened. In April and May 2009, attacks on Indian students began. Indian student numbers at that time had jumped 40%. Now it's really common to see a lot of Indian students here, but at that time that was the first big leap in the Indian student numbers. There were at the time about 45,000 Indian students in Melbourne. Over 12 months, according to an Indian government report, there were 152 reported assaults on Indian students in Australia. On the 23rd of May, a 25-year-old student named Saravan Tirtala was attacked by a group of teenagers armed with a screwdriver, and he was put into a coma. And this was following a series of attacks on trains, attacks at university campuses, and across the city. Thousands of Indian students and other supporters took to the streets of Melbourne to protest. During those protests, 18 students were detained. The police commissioner said things like, 
you shouldn't be using your laptop on a train because it encourages people to, to attack you. That they were concerned about the race card being played without just cause when there was clearly a racial motive to what was happening. This series of incidents escalated to get international attention. On the 1st of June, 2009, the Prime Minister of India, Manmohan Singh, telephoned Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, to express his concerns about what was going on for the safety of Indian students in Australia. And I remember working in the state government. I remember trying to speak to people about how to engage with our community and not getting much traction. I remember walking home one night to where I lived in Port Melbourne, past the tram depot. I was working, I wanted to help, um, and I wanted to get the government to talk to Indian students, but they wanted to talk to the police first to ensure law and order. There was very few Indian advisors in the government, unlike now, and I felt pretty frustrated. As I was walking, it was dark, I saw this big man <clears throat> in a leather jacket who was walking towards me, and as he drew closer, I thought, shit. This is it. I was terrified that I was going to be attacked, that he was a bikey, and that I was going to be the next news headline. But as I got closer, I realized he was actually pretty small. He had this terrified look on his face because he thought that I was the one who was going to attack him. I mean, I guess it was racist, but you know, it was just different. And uh, we were both caught up. We were both living in this world of fear. And I told myself, after that day, that I was going to find a way to step out of that, to make a change, that I knew that climate change was in our face, and so was racism. And for the next two years, I worked on both. I worked to introduce social media. I mean, Twitter had just started back then. Um, introduce social media into emergency services across Australia, and especially in Victoria, so we could better communicate during emergencies and let people know things a lot faster. I also got a scholarship and started going to law school part-time to understand laws and discrimination and how that could be used to make a difference. I started shifting to becoming a conscious leader. And that happened because I started moving to a life that was happening to me, to a life that was being directed by me. I learned to deal with facts, but I also to use the stories of what was happening around me as fuel Part of my why, part of why I wanted to do this, was a response to feeling so powerless during the Black Saturday bushfires and the Indian student attacks. I was sitting in your shoes a few years on, and I still felt like I didn't have the ability to make the change I wanted to make. I wanted power. And even though I was intellectually really interested in the law, underneath I knew that I was sort of a, more of a creative person, but I had a below the line reason. I wanted the skills and the power that I thought law could give me. So I journeyed through it. I went to law school part-time while I was working. I did clerkships. I got in a job in a commercial law firm, uh, much to my dad's delight <laughs> as an Indian dad. And while in law school, I experienced depression for the first time. It was a long road out, but I want to normalize that journey of mental health in our society because it's still not talked about enough. And I also I started to learn some important things about self-care that are also part of conscious leadership. But I was still below the line. Often being a lawyer is about being right. One of the, the partners that I work with described lawyers as professional pessimists. And I started to act that way. Uh, good things did happen too. I also got married. Um, and I also got my Australian citizenship um, in 2012 after a long road. Um, and while I was working then in that law firm, another incredible thing happened. I became a dad. My son Arjun was born with a serious heart condition that seemed okay the first few days. And then we took him home. And then we went for a checkup. And he had to go straight to the Royal Children's Hospital just up the road from here. And he had to have open heart surgery at 12 days old. The operation was a success. And he was okay, and he still is. But I was away from work for a month. When I came back to my law firm, I was a different person. I knew that I didn't have the spirit in the work that I was doing, but I wanted to make an impact to make, a, to make the world better and more inclusive so that my son could live in that world and so that who I was would have found an outlet 
had I been here in a different time. So I stayed at the law firm for about another year, and I started to work on side projects in human rights using the skills that I'd got. I learned how to reflect, I learned how to listen to myself and to others. I read a lot, I listened to podcasts, I learned about decision making and, and the principles for success and growth, and I took the lessons from the detail-oriented work of being a lawyer. I asked myself questions like, am I willing to change? How do I want to change? And what mattered to me and what I was resisting? And I didn't let myself say, I don't know. Because I learned that a conscious leader, if you're a conscious leader, saying I don't know is just resistance. Saying I'm trying is not the same as saying I'm willing to change and this is what I'm doing about it today. One of the principles of conscious leadership is being able to listen well, and that includes to yourself. The most important thing about listening consciously is to do so with candor to what is underneath, to see the truth, to see reality as it is, to ask people for an honest assessment of yourself and to expect that of yourself, to see reality as it is, to reflect on that, to write in your journal, to ask yourself good questions, to see what people say about you, and to see what they say to you. What kind of conversations do you spark in your interactions with people? It's also about learning appreciation. And that appreciation for a conscious leader is more than just paying attention. It's about making fine distinctions. The capacity for specificity becomes part of the delight. Appreciate out loud other people, yourself, make those relationships, circumstances, and experience become more valuable as a result. So I decided then to leave the law. I felt a little lost, but I learned that a good process creates a good outcome. So I took myself out to lunch once a fortnight. I asked myself questions and listened to what came up. I learned to appreciate the things that I was good at, writing, speaking, building networks, having a blank page, and being motivated by social impact. I worked on projects. I helped child cares become more safe. I helped young people leaving child protection get three years of free legal support. I taught leadership um, and worked on a project that helped fund community projects. I met a lot of South Asian people as our population swelled again in Victoria. I joined the board of a children's creative writing center that was a charity called 100 Story Building. And even though they lost my phone number after the f a really great first round interview, I had to wait three years before I could join the board. But after a year on the board, I, I loved walking into that room every single day, every single time I was there. And that was contagious. The chair of the board resigned, and they asked me to become the chair. And I just trusted my body and what it felt. I felt alive, I felt excited, and so I said yes. I listened to what others saw in me, what my body was telling me, what my heart was feeling, what my mind was feeling. And after five years as chair of that organization's board, I still love it. And I still love being this chair, and I still love what the organization is trying to do. So I came across, at that time, this podcast featuring a woman named Diana Chapman. And she'd written a book with a couple of other authors called The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. So I read the book. And I learned something really, really important. I learned many things which are the basis of this talk today. But I learned about being good at something. That being good at something is OK. And that being excellent at something is better. But I found in that book a framework that said there's something more than that. And it's called a zone beyond excellence. It's a zone that's held back by our own fears. It's called the zone of genius. And that's the place that every conscious leader looks for and looks to commit to. It's a, it's a zone that you're working at your highest level of creativity, but it also feels like play. So I encourage you to look for and find your zone of genius and to live in that zone. My zone of genius was the intersection of my own values, expression, creativity, community, leadership, and impact. I learned to overcome fear and self-doubt by trying and embracing the lessons of my zone and the lessons that come in during failure. 
I learned that conscious leaders don't fear the future fundamentally because they're too busy being a part of it and building it and shaping it. And after so long, by doing the work, by looking back on my story and reflecting and listening to myself and the wisdom others had about me, I found a way to truly be above the line. So do you remember that when I started, I said there were two things I was working on? I was working on my permanent residency, but do you remember the other thing that I was working on? I was writing a thesis about South Asian representation in the media in Australia. I spoke with a lot of the young people at the time, and I found that there was a new creative generation that was on its way up as the population increased. So I went back and I looked at what I'd studied. I'd seen the rise of Indian students, I'd seen the, the, the harm that was done to them. I'd seen their struggles. I'd lived through them myself. I'd taught leadership to many South Asian young people in my human rights work. I saw that Indians and South Asians were taking up more space but not represented in a media in Australia that was very, very white, even 15 years after I first arrived. And that there were going to be over a million of us in Australia, and social media and the technologies that were there were enabling a different world. So I decided to take this problem, a problem that a report came out two days ago that said that 78% of our television screens have white people on them, and that that doesn't reflect at all the population in this country, nor this room, for example. This was a problem that mattered to me, and this was the problem that I wanted to, to try and solve, and I didn't know how. So I decided to apply for a startup program called Catalyzer. The founder of Catalyzer is Usman, and he's in this room today. Uh, it's a program for migrants and refugees to work out how to work on problems from a startup perspective. I decided to do something and build the world that I wanted to see because no one else had done it yet. I wanted to take 100% responsibility for a life that was built by me, not a life that was happening to me, and do the work that fell into my zone of genius. And it was a special kind of yes. A full body yes. A full body yes is a principle of conscious leadership. It won't happen too often in your life, but a full body yes is a, a yes that aligns your head, your heart, and your guts. It takes the intelligence from your mind, the intelligence from your emotions, and the intelligence that we often don't listen to from our body, which is called BQ, a bodily quotient. It's an important thing that many of us haven't been exposed to and I hadn't been exposed to before. Until I felt a full body yes, I didn't even know what that was like. But you might have experienced it in the times when you're at your best and there's something about how your body feels in that moment that can be a, lighting, a guiding light to you. And because I was above the line, I was committed to learning in that startup program. Learning about how to do a startup for the first time was like, radically different for me than learning how to be a translator or learning how to be a lawyer. I could feel my whole body aligned with that work. I, and I reflected so often on the energy that it gave me. And that led to the creation of Saudi Collective, a media startup and a community for South Asian Australians. Our mission is to increase the visibility of South Asians in Australia. And we've already started to see some impact. We published in the last two years over 150 South Asian writers, and many of those have come to us with no experience whatsoever, just an idea. And we supported them and helped them to get a published byline that they were paid to write. We help people build skills. We help them get jobs in the media. We're the largest South Asian Australian outlet on LinkedIn today. We've built partnerships with major institutions like museums, art galleries, and theater companies. And we've built a community around the country. And I can't tell you how proud I am of our community and our team. We made it a point to learn from failure and to try and be conscious leaders. Last week, we announced that we received funding from the Google News Initiative because we serve underrepresented audiences to advance our work. This week, as I mentioned, Media Diversity Australia released its latest report that our news presenters over the last two years in Australia have become more white, that there are barriers to cultural diversity in media organizations because of the boards, the management, and the leadership, and there isn't even data on the cultural diversity quotients in news outlets across the country. We, we, we aren't even trying to get to the starting point. 
It doesn't reflect this room. It doesn't reflect our population. It doesn't reflect the interests and backgrounds and amazing skills and journeys that you all have and that we all have as migrants to this country. There's a lot more work to do. Many of our writers at Saudi Collective are like you. They're students. They're trying to discover the journey that they'll be on in Australia, and they talk about those stories. Many of them describe being on the outside of a culture and trying to find a way in, or even on the outside of their own culture and how it plays out here, trying to find that way in. And I can tell you to that feeling that I know it. I've lived it, and that if you feel like that, you're not alone. And I, my advice to you is this. Don't just work on your resume, but work on building your community. Just like the networking session we just had, find the people who care about the things that you care about, about what you do, or build something that puts it out in the world and shows it to people so to help them find you. Take a risk when you can. That risk is usually worth it. Um, so as I mentioned, Saudi Collective is just turned two. Um, and you know what's a good story about the real mark of our success? One of our writers was an international student who moved here nine months ago. Uh, she wrote a story about a dating app. Um, and uh, she was applying for a job, and they asked her, do you have any written work that you can show to us? And she didn't want to put in like a uni essay or something. And she had one story that she'd written for us, and she put that in as part of her application for this job. Uh, and she was able to get this job. And they said, your written work really helped you get this job because it showed us how you can think and your potential. Um, she recently came out here to go the India versus Pakistan cricket match. And if you can believe it, that was the first sporting, live sporting event she's ever been to in her life. And of course, she picked the most incredible you know, cricket match you could ever see. <laughs> so she's a pretty amazing person. But the other story that she has about her work is that um, uh, you know, she wrote about this dating app. So she's been single and she's dating. And she went on a really terrible date with another South Asian person. And she said that talking about Saudi Collective actually saved that date. She told me that, look, She's probably never going to date this guy again and go out with him. But she did say that in a, during that conversation, it was going pretty south pretty quickly, and they really had nothing to talk about. And she mentioned the, the stuff that she was doing for a Saudi collective and, and who we were, um, and that turned a bad date into a survivable date. So I don't know many organizations that are out there that are making an impact, but also can claim that kind of impact, but we feel pretty happy about that. Um, uh, and it's instilled in us to like continue to be motivated to do what we do and make that difference because it's, it's so needed. Um, the other things that I wanted to touch on about conscious leadership, that doing this work for the last two years has instilled in me that conscious leadership, um, you know, the skills that I had to have to be a better leader, to act with integrity and to build a network of people who supported me and people who came along with me through the journey. So there's three parts of integrity for being a conscious leader. The first part is learning how to manage your flow of energy. So if you have like a, something that's blocking you, something that you feel like is unsaid between yourself and another person, or something that you feel is unfelt, or something that is unowned by you, or a promise that's unkept, maybe there's an unhonored agreement that's come up in your life between people, and sometimes that even happens between friends. Uh, it's about clearing those out. It's about picking up the phone or addressing that thing or saying that, you know, this is what we need to say in this situation, even if you don't know how to navigate that exactly or if you don't know what the answer looks like. It's about putting that forward because otherwise it blocks your flow of energy and your flow of energy blocks you from, from the integrity that you feel coming and showing up. The second part of integrity is acting with congruence. So making sure that, like, that feelings that you have inside are processed above the line and that that matches how you act on the outside. And the third part of integrity is aligning with your life's purpose. And for me, that's something that I wrote about when I was an international student, but it took me years to bring to life, only came to life because of the opportunities that came up along the way and the network that I'd built and the vulnerability that I put out there. To build that network, you have to understand your why and speak about it openly and with curiosity for others. Tell people your story again and again and again. Work on the story until it sounds true and sounds right to you, and when you say it, you feel an energy in your body. I've told the story of myself and Saudi Collective to over 2,000 people in one-on-one -on -one conversations over the last three years. 
And every time I say it, I feel energy from it. And the other people I speak to get an energy back from it. And it resonates with them because it's also part of their experience as well. That journey of trying to fit in here in Australia. So build relationships that actively support you with effort and give back to people as much as you can possibly do. One of my first jobs in Australia I got because I was volunteering to help kids and that led to a community engagement job that helped me stay here a bit longer. Assume those people can be your allies. When you have disappointments, hold them lightly, hold them quickly, value your time and the time of others. It took me 20 years to become a founder. And if I looked at it below the line, I'd feel like I started so late that I lost so much time that I wasted so much time. But if I look at it another way, if I change the story, if I look at it above the line, I realize that I had a lot of lessons that I needed to learn. That I was learning a principle that is really, really important. Patience and playing the long game. I realize that success is not a finite end point but a way that you are. So today, standing in front of you, I'm 41 years old. And as it turns out, that's the average age of a startup founder. So I've learned that at any point in your life, you can step into becoming a conscious leader, that you can start whenever you choose to play the long game, but play a game that feels valuable enough to be the long game for you. Last month, Saudi Collective won the Victorian government's Multicultural Media Award. No longer is there as much of a gap as there was when I first arrived. No longer would Indian students feel like there was no representation. Soon, we'll see more and more and more of us in the media and in politics. For the first time ever in Australia, the federal parliament has four South Asian representatives. There is no turning back, and the future is full of so much promise. So I'm glad, I'm glad I never became a translator, an emergency management or climate change media specialist, a lawyer or a human rights project manager. God, the list is endless. In reality, I've been all those things. But they've led me on a journey to becoming a founder. And more importantly, they've led me on a journey to becoming a conscious leader. So to wrap things up, what is conscious leadership? It's all of those things, that's your Instagrammables you know, slide for you to take a photo and try and remember what I've said today. It's reflecting and feeling your feelings all the way through to completion, including failure. It's stepping outside of the drama triangle, not being a victim, villain, or hero, or recognizing those when they pop up. It's being above the line, open, curious, willing to learn, choosing purpose over power, or being right. It's shifting from a a life that is lived to me, to a life that is lived by me, and taking 100% responsibility for making that happen. It's working with facts, but using the stories around you, the stories of your life, and the stories of others that resonate with you as fuel. It's listening really well. It's a skill that can be developed, but it's also listening well to yourself. It's accepting and giving appreciation, specific, that is specific and sincere. We know how hard it is in the struggles now to make it, to be successful, from becoming a student, to becoming, uh, to finding a career, and that everyone needs that little bit of something that appreciates who they are and what they do uh, more often than we think, and we love when we receive those feelings. It's trying and finding to work in your zone of genius, whatever that is, what feels like play to you. It's making a full body yes to something. You might have to wait a while before that happens, but it's an important principle that your body will tell you when you're making a full body yes. It's acting with integrity, which is energy, clearing the flow of energy, congruence, and alignment with your purpose, and it's playing the long game. So lastly, I'll leave you with this. Conscious leaders have a goal. It's the same goal of many startup founders and social entrepreneurs. It's about making win for all creative solutions to the problems that we face. I know many of you in this room want to tackle the problems in our world. Some of the problems we've heard about today, some of the problems that you know better than I do, some of the problems that have impacted your life, the life of your family or your friends or your communities. Take those problems and make change. 
that means that you're already on your way to becoming a conscious leader. Use these ideas to become successful sustainably. So go. Start tomorrow what you haven't started today. Take 100% responsibility. Go and be the resolution that you and the world are looking for because I'm a testament to the fact that unless you do it sometimes, no one else will. And it's okay to fail. I failed many times along the way. But make sure you feel it all the way through and make sure you learn from it. And just remember that your journey might take some time and that's okay. It won't make sense sometimes until you look back, but when you do, you'll realize that playing the long game and being above the line is worth it in the end. Thank you. Wow. Um, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Sandeep, for sharing your story. I wrote a few notes myself, and I think the through line that I got from what you said before was the power of stories. And I, I wrote to myself here, yeah, the stories we tell ourselves are the stories we become. You tell yourself a story below the line, you become the person below the line. Mm -hmm. You tell your story of yourself above the line, you become the person above the line. And I think the framing of, you know, you reframe from to me to by me, and that just reminded me of one of the things that, in a mindset perspective, the strongest prisons that we create for ourselves those are the strongest prisons we have are the ones that we create for ourselves. So when mm -hmm. you have that mindset shift, you change those prisons and you liberate yourself. So yeah. please, another warm welcome for Sandeep. Thank Sandeep, you. Thank you. Yeah, I will say to that too, Michael, that you know, sometimes the context creates a particular mindset too, right? So you might be in a particular space like kind of I was in with that job where you, the environment is not giving you a vision of what a buy me even looks like. And so you, you buy into a mentality in the story that you create about to me. So sometimes being in a different context can help you shift as well. Um, and you might not realize, you might think, this isn't the best place or job or role or thing I'm studying. And, and you don't realize that underneath that it's telling you something that you, you're wanting to shift, but the space around you isn't encouraging that. So um, that's just an idea behind that, yeah. Right, I want to have the opportunity for Q and A, the Please. audience. I know we're running two time with lunch. And I wanted to pick someone, pick someone from this section of the room. Was there any reflections, insights, questions that you had for Sandeep? Right away. Um, hi. hi. Um, what was your nice, name? I'm Sokshim. Uh, nice to meet you. Yeah. And yeah, I realize uh, your speech was very inspirational and very helpful. Um, yeah, I can remember like in, back in 2020, yeah. Uh, I made some emotional decisions and um, I had a huge loss. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so uh, like, do you, ha do you follow any practice or any schedule to make uh, conscious decisions? Because, yeah. yeah, so that was my main question because I made, I'm very bad at making conscious decisions. I, most okay. of the time, my emotions influence me and I have faced a lot of losses. So, yeah. Yeah, do you have any schedules or practices? Yeah, absolutely, there's a couple I follow. I will say though that um, in the work that, that is listed in this book and the work that the Conscious Leadership Institute does, uh, they find that most CEOs that they work with, especially in Silicon Valley, are actually below the line. And most of them are you know, ruled by their emotions and making decisions, so it's not just you. <laughs> um, and those lessons of failure are really important to, to build on. Um, for me, there's a couple practices that I have. Um, one, uh, as I mentioned, I take myself out to lunch uh, every fortnight or every month, and I have a series of questions I ask myself to see how I'm going, what I'm liking, what I'm not, what I've learned, what decisions I've made, what I haven't. So it's good to reflect back. And then, you know, I have this theory that human beings are sometimes not that good at predicting what's going to happen in the future, but we have really good brains for analysis, right? So if you look back and look at, oh, I took myself out to lunch over the last six months, and I keep seeing the same thing happening again, um, that's a sign to you that maybe something needs to improve, maybe you need to read a bit more about how to make that decision. The other practice that I have uh, is a creative practice called the morning pages. And so I buy a small notebook and I get up every morning and I write three pages longhand of just whatever is on my mind. And it's some pretty ugly stuff sometimes about self-doubt and fear. Um, but I realize that once I process that, like if I'm thinking about something, it just helps me write out and process that pen to paper. Um, and that has always 
really helped me. And then the last thing I do is if I'm making a big decision, I wait 24 hours. Yeah, and sorry, I have one last question. Sure. I just want to make sure, like, uh, is it okay to tell your story? Because I feel very insecure to share myself, like, to share my story. Yeah. Yeah, so I just want to make sure, is it okay to share stories? If I can give you permission and that helps, 100%. It's definitely right to tell your story. Um, uh, the drama triangle is also the way that Western narratives are built. So every good story, like, you know, it's a boring story if, hey, I just did this and I was successful and then I did this and I was successful. That's not really how human society works, right? And how life works. The things that you struggle with, guaranteed someone else is struggling with that. Guaranteed it's someone else. And if you lead with that openness and vulnerability to say, hey, look, this is my story. I've been trying, but I haven't worked that out yet. That's a call for someone to help you. Like if you told Matt to me and I had a means that I could help you with the problem that you're facing, that opens up the ability to help. Oftentimes when um, I mentor some people and they're like, well, how do I network? And I said, well, talk about what challenge you're, you're facing because otherwise if people don't know, they're not able to help you. So I'd encourage you to be as open and honest and vulnerable with your story as you can. If you need help, we're a place that's already collected that can help you <laughs> tell that in a, in a way. Or you know, if it's just something you want to do yourself, start with people you trust and, and then maybe have lunch with someone you know, or go out there and, and put yourself out there and see, get comfortable to the point. I'm not saying say every bad thing that's ever happened to you or all the wrong things, but you can frame it in the sense of challenge. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time and distance when something bad happens before you're able to articulate it, and that's okay. You don't have to talk about it right away. But like you said, you face some challenges, and maybe they're a little bit while ago to the point where you can process that and speak to it. Um, then speak to it. Say your truth. Thank you very much. Sandeep, are you staying for lunch afterwards? I'll be here, yeah, until okay. about 1.20. Okay, great. So, standing between all of us and lunch is either another question or would you like to have lunch? Oh, there's a question. Okay, we'll go for another question. It's decided. Hey? Would you, would you like to ask a question while we're here? Or do you want to wait for lunch? All right. Okay, great. Um, I think... Is there another question? Yep, sorry, Oh, there's a couple. Hungry then, questions. Just know you're keeping everyone, <laughs> the entire room, from eating lunch. That's fine, I think. <laughs> uh, hi, Sandeep. Uh, really nice to meet you. Uh, uh, so just to build on the qu question that he asked, how do you make your story interesting? Because if you're telling your story again and again, and you said that you spoke about your story all to almost about 2,000 people in the last three huh. years, uh, it might have gone pretty boring, right? But if you're not doing something new, so but, and we as international students, we are doing almost the same thing every day. So how do you make that interesting? And whenever you are up for a job, how do you portray that to your potential employer that yes, I am an interesting person and you should hire me? Yeah, great question. And many people come to us with this, how do I make something interesting? I think the two things, one, uh, it's not gonna be interesting to everybody. So there's an audience out there for your thing, and that becomes from the type of people you have a conversation with or the type of questions that you ask. So much of that is about asking questions and listening first and seeing what people say and often using their vocabulary. In fact, one of the lines that um, someone said, I said, hey, we're working in this space of you know, community building and South Asian representation. Um, what is that like for you? And they said, oh, you know, I always feel like uh, there's brown people around, but they're always our uncles, and they're a bit dodgy, and I always feel like I'm on the outside of my own culture finding a way in. And I was like, wow, that's a really great way to say that. And then the ne I literally had his back-to-back -back Zoom call, the next person, and I said, oh, we're working on this thing, and it's been described to me as like sitting on the outside of our own culture and the, trying to find a way in as a new generation. And the person said, ah, that's exactly how I feel. That's exactly right. And then I just started saying, so I literally stole like an artist and stole something. So I think what you find interesting, take that. <laughs> like, just borrow it. If you, if you hear a story that's really cool, I mean, you, you can Google, like, Pixar's techniques for storytelling, but that won't really help you. I think it's about you having that genuine be like, hey, I really find, you know, whatever this thing is. I mean, a friend of mine is working on a startup that uses maggots to uh, destroy waste right now, and it produces byproducts that are sustainable, and it's really cool. Um, but like when I ask him about it, he's just super excited about waste and, and maggots. And it's not a conversation that I roll with that much, but I can just tell from his energy that he's really excited about it. So you make it interesting by being interested. 
right? And by conveying what is what makes it interesting to you to say, hey, I'm interested in this thing because this, this person spoke about this. I just found it really interesting. That is a good story because that is, is true to you and it's about what you find interesting and other people will pick up on the energy of that discussion as opposed to trying to artificially say some big thing that happened to try and make it interesting. All right, Sandeep, we're gonna go to lunch, yeah. but I wanted to see if you wanted to have a challenge that you wanted the participants to do during lunch. So for instance, during tea time, I said, go network with two to three new people. Is yeah. there anything you wanna challenge them to do during lunch? Uh, yeah, I had a good one. Um, it's a little bit different. It comes back to the idea of um, for body yes, so head, heart, and guts. And it's about your body. So uh, one of the times, uh, one of the things to mention to other, another person is a time when you felt like at your best or at your highest or something you've achieved that was awesome. Um, but don't just talk about that thing. When you talk about that thing, describe how you felt. Describe how your body felt in that moment. It's a really unusual thing to try and do, but to say that, hey, you know, when I, uh, when we won an award for Saudi Collective, I felt like really grounded, like my feet felt like on the ground and I was like a tree trunk and I had stability from which to stand on. Um, and that's how I felt in my body. So I would try and use that because that vocabulary is something we have buried and it's a really important thing to try and like rekindle in yourself. So it may feel a bit weird, but if everyone's doing it, we're all weird together and that's okay. So um, I would encourage you to try and reflect on a great moment that you had, but also how your body felt to build up that body intelligence to complement your clear IQs that's in the room and your clear emotional intelligence that's in the room. I think that's a great challenge. And one more thank you for Sandeep. And then we can head off to lunch in the same room that we came from. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.